Hey, CBC Online Church, my name is Ed Newton, pastor at Community Bible Church, and wherever you're watching from, know it's an honor to have you a part of what God's doing here in San Antonio and around the world. We know this, that it's not an accident you're watching today, and we want to say thank you for being a part of today's episode. As we talk about this principle of winsome, what does that word mean? Irresistible influence, that we would live a life that would be distinctly different making much of who Jesus is and what he's called us to be about. And so as we talk about these core values that shape what it means to be winsome, our first core value is honor. That is to give worth and to esteem all people from all walks of life. Jesus was the very best at this and we wanna follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so our prayer today is as you listen and you lean in, that you would understand that you're a person of worth and that Jesus has esteemed you so that you can esteem others. And so as we listen today, may your heart be open and may you be receptive to how God speaks to you. We are CBC and CBC are we. It's who we are. And as we have been walking through this new series called Winsome, that's a word that we want to be a part of our vocabulary. We begin to change culture when we speak a common vocabulary and we have the same vision. What does it mean to be winsome? Irresistible influence, attractional living. It's not just doing something, it's being something. And we have looked at our logo and we've seen these five dots and those five dots are chromosomes, they're DNA. It's who we are. Honor, humility, hustle, hospitality, high capacity. They're not just core values for our staff, it's core values for our house. We got house rules. Our house rules are we operate in these five core values. Not just so we could create an atmosphere here but so this atmosphere actually can I just tell you this? San Antonio needs this atmosphere. San Antonio needs this atmosphere where people from all walks of life sit on the same road together, feel as if they got nothing in common together, but then they realize I'm not alone in the journey. We will not be a community of faith that seeks to shame people, but to celebrate people, to give worth and value to people. That's who we are. It's who we've always been. It's the foundation in which this church was built. We're asking God, give us people that nobody wants so we could turn them into people that everybody wants. That's who we are. We're going to love without limits. We're going to seek to understand before we're understood. We're going to continue to live a life that operates in context. Everybody's got a backstory, but we want them to know a future story. That there's a God in the midst of the story that wants to rewrite the story that you and I would understand that it's his story for his glory, his fame, his name, his renown in you. And as we understand that today, we begin with core value number one, which is honor. So if you got a Bible, can we just go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 6? Mark chapter 6. Now, we're going to get there eventually, I promise you. But I just want to reference our two scripture bullet points that are in the listener guide today as we talk about MVP, not just most valuable player, because that seems to be the people that we give value and honor to, people with power, prestige, possessions or platforms. That's who we seem to honor. But when we talk about honor, MVP, that we would be a people that makes value possible. We live in a culture that's void of honor. And I'm not talking about San Antonio, Texas. Listen, of all the cultures I've ever been in, this is one of the most honorable cultures that I've ever engaged in in regards to a city. We are a church that operates in honor. When we talk about honor, it's making value possible. We live in a society, in a nation, where entitlement has been the predominant synonym of our context. But we want to make value possible. Two scripture references that serve as the springboard into our conversation today. Scripture reference number one. 1 Peter 2.17 says, honor everyone. Period. Notice there's no parentheses. It doesn't say if they look like you, talk like you, do what you do. It actually says everyone. There's no qualifying statement. There's no disclaimer. There's no like contractual agreement with a bunch of fine print at the bottom. It's not the marketing pitch that all of a sudden as they make that presentation, then they begin to speak 170 miles an hour at the end, hoping that they could blur the words together so you missed it. No, it's real simple. Like we love our neighbor and hello, we don't get to pick our neighbor that we would choose to love God and love people, and we do that by honoring everyone. It says love the brotherhood. It would mean that we would not just honor people in this room, but we would actually honor people outside of this room, that we would see them the way that God sees them. 
And so as we embrace this, it says fear God, that we would honor God. And then it goes on to say honor the emperor. That is to embrace and also esteem these positions of authority in our lives, government structure, social structures, civil structures, parenting, home structures, workplace structures, that we would seek to honor everyone. But then it goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 21, for we aim, what's the target? We want to aim at this. Our purpose, our point, the arrow is being shot in that direction. We're aiming at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Why do we want to live in a culture of honor? Because we believe that when we choose to honor people the way that God honors people, then we are actually a part of the miraculous. I don't know about you, but I desire for God to show himself in signs and wonders every time we come in this place. That God would begin to restore, that he would make new, that he would mend, that he would begin to do the supernatural in such a way that this would be a fertile soil in which the word of God and its seed would fall and it would produce a harvest in lives, that marriages would be restored, that children that need blessing would walk in blessing, that they would understand moms and dads in the room, that the prodigal could come home in your life again as you wait eagerly for that young man or that young lady to come back and knock on the door and go, can I come back in? And so I don't know where you find yourself today, but there's a God that's been seeking and searching for you. He honors you today. We'll conclude our service in communion. It's a beautiful way to wrap up this message. But as we seek to live a life of giving honor, there are three principles I'd love to give you today real quickly. Point number one, we notice the principle of honor. The principle of honor. Now, what does the word honor mean? The meaning. As we look to our notes to put value to something, to recognize it as precious and worthy of respect. But sometimes to get handles on a definition we just don't look at the meaning. We actually have to look at the antonym. Now, some of you in the room are going, I, I don't even know what an antonym is. It's actually the opposite of the word. So the opposite of the word honor is to dishonor. Now, here's what we know to be true. That when you look at the definition of dishonor, it literally means this. Now, Sunday at 10, listen to me. You gotta get this principle because I believe it's the linchpin for everything we'll talk about today. When we choose to dishonor someone, here's what we're doing. We're making them common. To dishonor someone is to make them common. To bring them down. To say there's nothing special, there's nothing significant, there's nothing superior about you. We sometimes find us feeling better about ourselves when we begin to push people down. But that's not the kingdom. Jesus and every conversation was lifting people up. And when we choose to embrace that, you've heard me say this multiple times, the only time you're ever afforded to look down on somebody is when you're helping them up, extending a hand. As we look down our nose at people, it's actually in the effort of pulling them in the direction that they would understand that God loves them and is for them and fights for them and champions them. So when we talk about meaning, we now got to talk about motive. Because sometimes we can confuse the word honor and respect. They're very similar. But there's a distinction between the two. Honor and respect. Respect is an action. But to honor is an attitude. Let me give some handles to that. Moms and dads, you ever ask your kids to do a chore? Specifically, let me be, if you will, precise. Fold the towels. Now, with four children, we go through a lot of towels in our house. Can you fold these towels? Yes. Out of respect and obedience, they fold the towels. It's an action. But when they go a step further to honor, here's what they do. Without being told, they put the towels in the cabinet because they recognize this is going to stay in the basket. Mom or dad, most likely mom, is going to have to put the towels in the cabinet because I need to learn the principle of honor, that this would remove an additional step of how mom always creates a culture of honor. She's the one putting things in place. She's the one looking out for you in areas you didn't even know she was looking out for you. And so when she asks you to do something, yes, it's for your benefit, but when you honor someone and to go an extra step, here's what you're saying, because I esteem you and I value you, not because you're over me, but because I actually love you and I think that you are a gift in my life. We honor them. 
We see this when we go to the AT&T Center. The most amazing thing to me when I go to a Spurs game, and those of you that have been late coming in much like I have, all of a sudden you're trying to get a drink and a hot dog, and the national anthem is going on. Can I just say this to you? You ain't going to get a drink and a hot dog when the national anthem is going on. Why? Because the whole concourse has stopped. It's who we are as a culture. So that vendor, all of a sudden with their hand over their heart, all of a sudden begins to give not only tribute to a flag, respect to a flag, but they give honor to the men and women that defended freedom. Do you see the difference? So when we understand respect, it's one thing to respect. It's another thing to honor. Honor. But where do we get this concept of honor? It's God. I mean, you think about this. Revelation 7, 12, it's in your notes. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever. Amen. Have you thought about this? We are living on a rock that is three planets from the sun, spinning hundreds, thousands of miles per hour. If our planet tilted one degree left or right, we either freeze or we fry. I mean, just small microscopic numbers determine our destiny. But we live on a privileged planet. But also we have a God who doesn't need us but invites us into a relationship with him. And here's the greatest miracle of all in regards to honor. This God who's worthy of honor actually honors you. Have you thought about that? The fact that you're alive today, the fact that we have breath today, they call it general grace that we experience grace, whether or not we're a Christ follower or not, whether we honor God or not, he honors us. We're alive today because of him. We exist today because of him. We move today because of him. He honors us. But watch this. So when a person enters into a relationship with him, these are actually Bible words. We're adopted. We're ambassadors. He calls us the beloved. We're chosen new creations, forgiven, holy. Have you thought about that? He calls us holy, justified, righteous, redeemed, royal, worthy. You're like, you, you don't know what I did last night. No, God knows. And what he chooses to do is continually pursue you to bestow upon honor in your life so that you'll fully recognize who you are by recognizing who he is. And when you recognize who he is, that he is a benevolent, grace-giving, majestic, marvelous, merciful God, then you begin to realize, I'm not an accident. Somebody might have told you that, that you have no significance, but God goes, no, no, no. They don't get to determine your worth and value, I do. And your worth and value is not based upon how you dress, what you wear, where you live, what you do. Your worth and value comes from the fact that you were created by God and you are an image bearer of the king. And when we embrace that, here's what we understand. Not only the principle of honor, but we actually embrace the promise of honor. Point number two, write this down. The promise of honor. Now we know the first time the commandment to honor is given is in the Ten Commandments, specifically in regards to a parent and child relationship. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and the message translation says this, honor your father and mother, but watch this, so that you will live a long time in the land that God is giving you. Now that commandment was specifically given to all of us, but the context was in regards to the children of Israel being delivered from bondage, slavery from the Egyptians into a land flowing with milk and honey, the proverbial crackle barrel. Are y'all with me? All right, so, so God is going, I wanna take you from this to this. But what did he say was the principle with promise? Not just don't murder, don't commit adultery, all of those statements were definitive, but this was definitive with a distinction that had a promise attached to it that you may live long in the land. Now, Ephesians chapter 6 begins to add to this. For many of you, you've used this in parenting with your children, but I want you to notice the principle behind honor in regards to obedience. Now, when we talk about the pathway of honor, listen to this. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Then verse 2 says this, Ephesians 6, verse 2. Honor 
your father and mother, in parentheses, English Standard Version, this is the first commandment with the promise, but listen to verse 3. 10 o'clock service, y'all still with me? Say amen. Watch this promise. Verse 3, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So there's an additional promise. There's two promises in regards to not just obedience, but to honor. Now, what's the concept? The concept is this. Moms and dads, teach your children to obey and to honor authority. Here's the reason why. Because in obedience and honor of people that have been placed over you, it unlocks and unleashes blessing in your life. Why is that important? Moms and dads, it's not just so little Johnny doesn't interrupt your life at home that we teach obedience and honor. It's not just so you can tolerate your children. It's so that your children can actually thrive in society because if they can't obey physical authority in your home, they're gonna have a difficult time obeying physical authority outside of your home Take it a step further for someone that says, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. That person ends up in two places, prison or the military. <laughs> Hello. That's hashtag real talk right now. That's real talk. And here's what I'm saying to you. So when we talk about physical authority, the reason why God would say this is the only promise with or excuse me, only commandment with a promise, a blessing, it's not just so you can obey physical authority because if you can't obey physical authority, how difficult will it be to obey invisible authority? That's the principle. If you can't obey physical authority, you're gonna have a difficult time obeying spiritual or invisible authority. So that's the principle that has the promise attached to it. Now, are you still with me at Mark chapter six? Let me read something to you. Now, hang with me on this. Remember I told you to hang on to the thought that to dishonor is to make common? Watch how this unfolds. Mark chapter six, the Bible very clearly talking about Jesus not being welcome in his own hometown. Listen to this, Mark chapter six, verse one. He went away from there, came to his own hometown. His disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? Now, that question or that statement may come across as they're honoring Jesus, but that's not what they're doing. Notice this, verse 3. Watch how they dishonor Jesus and what unfortunately is said about this city. Is not this carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and and John or Judas and Simon and his sisters here with us. Then it goes on to say, verse four, and Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, amongst his relatives, in his own household. Now watch this. Because there was dishonor, they're, they're saying to Jesus, this is what they're saying. We know your daddy. We know your mama. We know your brothers and your sisters and you're just like us. There's nothing special about you. There's nothing significant about you. There's definitely not something supernatural about you. And so what they're doing is they're devaluing Jesus. They're making him common. But Jesus ain't common. He is supernatural. He's the God man. But watch what Jesus says because they showed him no honor. Jesus is doing the miraculous all over the region except in his own hometown. And notice what's said in verse six. And he marveled because of their unbelief and he went about among the villages teaching. He can only do, you'll see this in verse five, he can only do a few miracles and mighty works. What opened the door unto the miraculous everywhere Jesus went except in his own hometown? Honor, when they honored him. See, you'll see this in Luke chapter seven, Verse 9, Roman centurion has a servant. He goes to Jesus and goes, hey, listen, my guy's sick. Jesus, could you just speak the word? Jesus, watch this. He begins to walk in that direction. And the Roman centurion who walks in honor looks at Jesus and goes, no, 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 no. Like, you don't have to go to my house. You're, you're a man of honor, and I understand honor. And you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word, Jesus. And so he speaks the word. And here's what he began to say in Luke chapter 7, verse 9. Jesus would say he marveled. Watch this. Marveled unbelief, few miracles. Marveled 
about the belief of a Roman centurion, and guess what happened? The Roman centurion goes home, and his servant is healed at the exact time in which Jesus spoke. So what we're saying is this, what unlocks, are y'all with me? What unlocks the miraculous to happen in the supernatural amongst us is operating with high honor for who Jesus is and operating in high honor for what he's doing amongst us. So when we choose to live in honor for all people, regardless of title, see, when we talk about honor, oftentimes it's misunderstood. I'm not demanding honor, I just wanna deliver honor. I don't see honor as a title, I see honor as a testimony. It's not something that I'm trying to get. See, everybody's trying to get honor. But everybody's trying to get honor in the wrong way, which means you gotta come back next weekend to hear Second core value of humility. <laughs> Subtle commercial there. <laughs> so when we begin to understand the crisis, watch this, we live in a culture with no honor. But when we begin to infiltrate honor into our house, guess what happens? We begin to see people the way God sees people. Then the miraculous begins to happen. So people come into this place and they don't feel shame. They don't feel criticized. They don't hear behavior modification. And then God accepts you. as no, God loves you just as you are. But he loves you way too much to leave you there. He brings you on a journey. And we've all been on that journey. And I don't understand it how God would give me honor because I at times feel as if I'm only deserving of dishonor because so many times in my own heart I'm divided distracted and even the idolatry in my own heart begins to get in the way now I'm glad you're here because to be honest with you I'm just preaching to myself I'm just so thankful you're here to listen to this message because here's how this works out it's point number three real quickly it's the pathway to honor now I don't have time to give you letter A, B, C and D but let me just set this up Honor is mandated to government and civil authorities. You just got to read Romans 13. Now, I want you to hear me. There are going to be moments in the future that you may feel the resistance as laws are beginning to, if you will, go away from the principles of God's word. That's already happening in our society. So whether it's right to obey God or to obey man, Acts chapter 4 would say this, Simon Peter would say, we choose to obey God. Anytime a law is passed that causes us to, if you will, go away from our core convictions of the Bible, we gotta wrestle in that tension. We, we respect the rank. Don't miss that, that's a military phrase. We may not respect the man, but we respect the rank. We may not respect the woman, but we respect the rank because we want honor to be bestowed upon them because God loves them, God has a heart for them. But when we understand honor in authority, government, civil, social, marketplace, we have to operate in honor. Here's the reason why Romans 13 would say that person got there because God allowed it to happen. Which means if we got beef with the issue, if, if we got tension with the issue of who's been placed in authority, we actually need to go to God and we pray and we petition, and we begin to go, God, help me. I, I know you allowed this. I don't see the full picture. I disagree with a lot of things that are being said, but God, you allowed it to happen. I don't know why you allowed it to happen, but you see things at a level that I don't see things, and I'm just gonna be obedient to Romans 13, and I'm just gonna honor all people in authority that you put over me, and I'm gonna choose to live that way. How different would our society be if we chose to operate in honor? especially in regards to those who've been placed over us. In your workplace, wherever you go, it's mandated. Also, it's gotta be demonstrated. I love how Hebrews 13 verse eight would say, 18 would say this, pray for us for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Just a quick story. My daughter London's a ninth grader, passionate athlete. It's a basketball game and there was a foul called against her she submitted to the referee, but her body language did not. <laughs> so she obeyed, but her hands were. <laughs> I'm in the bleachers. I lean over to my wife, Stephanie, I go, no, she didn't. <laughs> so my wife and I drive to the game from two different appointments. I go, hey, Steph, I got London. We're going to talk on the way home. And 
hey, baby girl, I love you. I appreciate your passion, but you can't talk to that referee like that. You understand that, right? Like, you, you, you cannot do that. You're dishonoring the referee. So we get home. My daughter, London's so sweet and apologetic. She's like, Dad, I'll work on it. I put her to bed. The Spirit of God begins to deal with me. She got that from you, Ed, because you were in the bleachers doing this right here. <laughs> On the way to school. <laughs> hey, London, can, can we talk about what we talked about last night? The Lord dealt with me on how I was dishonoring to the referee. Could, could you forgive me? Because I was doing the same thing you were doing just from a different angle. When we choose to operate in honor, here's what we're saying. I'm not going to always get it right. But I'll be man enough to own it and go, could you forgive me? Could you forgive me? Now, the right way to have handled that was to find the referee and go, hey, listen, you probably didn't see me. <laughs> but he most likely would have went, yeah, I saw you. You're the pastor at Community Bible Church. And I, <laughs> matter of fact, I already told 17 people about you. And so, <laughs> but it's got to be demonstrated. Let me just make these two passing statements. It's got to be initiated and consecrated. What, is, what does that mean? If honor does not exist in our culture, society, then it's not going to happen accidentally. We actually have to be intentional with it. So can I just CBC? You, you've heard me say this. We are CBC. What does it mean to be CBC? We champion others. You say, Pastor Ray, can, can you explain that? What does it mean to champion others? We celebrate people. That's why it's on the wall out there. We initiate and celebrate life change in Jesus' name. What does it mean to celebrate someone or champion someone that you look at people and you brag on them in their presence? For example, Tom, I'm telling you, man, you did that so well. Just want to tell you, I'm so proud of you. In a conversation, multiple people, Tom's in the conversation with somebody else. Hey, Bill, Tom, I'm telling you, he demonstrated excellency in this decision that he made. I'm, I, I just got to brag on Tom. Tom is a man of God, full of character, integrity. Tom's not a part of the conversation. I'm with, I'm running out of names in my head right now. <laughs> but in that moment, I'm going, hey, listen, you should have seen Tom. Tom's not even in the conversation. We're celebrating if we're going to be a culture of honor, here's what we got to learn to do. It, that is to outdo one another in showing honor. That's a biblical principle, Romans 12, 10. You know what that means? That I would eagerly and earnestly find it as a competition to outdo you in honor. You're bragging on me. No, I'm going to brag on you. <laughs> well, you bragged on me two times. I'm going to brag on you four times. You're like, that's weird. No, actually, it's inviting. Because people go, listen. They don't celebrate my defeats. They celebrate my victories. They don't celebrate my past. They celebrate my future. Which means that not only we celebrate others or champion others, but we are present. We got to be present. CBC, champion others, be present. Which means we don't just listen with our ears. We listen with our eyes. We're in conversation with people. We're not like. No, you're locked in. Because what they have to say matters. I'm working on that. My ADD gets in the way. But there's a lot of moments where I find myself thinking about other things. And can we just be honest here? This is a, this is a conversation where you are thinking about, I got to get to point A, or from point A to point B. And this moment is an interruption. It's not that I don't value you. I just got to get somewhere. But could it be that in the process of trying to get to point B, that really in your effort to go to point B, you met the person along the way from point A to point B, and it's not really about you getting to point B. That, that's important about you getting to point B. But the person that interrupted is not an interruption. They're an invitation. That really God's doing something in their life, and God would trust you and honor you in such a way to go, I'm going to put Ed or you in that person's path, so they can understand that I love them. I, tr I trust Ed or you to be my mouth. 
And not only that, not only do we celebrate, but we're present. We got to be present, but then we call out. What does it mean to call out? Watch this. Oftentimes, when I said call out, we have a tendency to go negative. So we call out dishonor. I mean, that, that's true, but let me speak to it in this direction. To call out means this, that for some of us, we are our own worst critic. Nobody's harder on Ed Newton than Ed Newton. And I'm so thankful I had some people in my life that began to speak life into me and said some things to me as I was growing up that prophetically was speaking into my future. They were calling out things I did not see in myself. Could we be a people? Could we be a church that when we look at folks, we would see what God's doing in them and we would call it out to go, I see this in you. You know why that's important? They might not see that in themselves. And God's using you to call it out, to draw it out. We are CBC. And when we think about honor, it's this winsome spirit, irresistible influence. We had the privilege this week to interview David Robinson. When I think about honor and winsome, the people's champ, David Robinson, I so wish he could put back on that Spurs jersey. We need him in round one of the playoffs right now. But I believe you would agree to this. Now, some of you showed up today with your Spurs jersey, and you're like, hey, Pastor Ed, you said he was a, it was going to be a cameo appearance. It's just on video. <laughs> but understand, out of honor, had some time constraints. It's hard to ask David Robinson to be in all five services. You're going to see more of this interview. But I want to show you something about how his mom and dad raised him in honor. Win some spirit. Turn your eyes to the screen. Check out this interview. Just want to ask you this, David, in regards to irresistible influence, who would be that one name that pops in your mind when you talk about the greatest impact on your life? Wow. Uh, I, I have to go back to mom and dad. Um, you know, my mother grew up in the South. She grew up in South Carolina. Um, my dad grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, and both of those times were a, a difficult place for African Americans to grow up in. Um, and I think watching them and how they show just such a high level of dignity and um, and courage uh, to push on and to make their children's lives better than their life uh, showed me a level of sacrifice that I think going forward, I always felt like I had an obligation to live up to that. And I think they taught me how to show respect to all people, regardless of where they come from or what they say or, or whatever. I, I, I always got that sense from my mother and father that they, um, they grew up in a tough time, but they always had a level of respect, and they showed that respect, uh, regardless of whatever the circumstances were. And I think that that was something that stuck with me as, at an early age, because I, I don't know how I would respond if somebody would have told me, you're, you're not smart enough because you're black, mm. or you can't do this because you're black. I, I grew up in a time where I could do anything I wanted to do. That's right. I could go to any school I wanted to do, pretty much. I, I had, there were no limitations. But my father grew up in 1957 in Little Rock where he couldn't even go to the local high school, Central, mm. Central High School, until they integrated. And I mean, the governor came out in 58 and said, we're closing the schools down because we don't want to integrate the schools. And so for them to grow up in that type of environment, and, but yet to train me to not hold any grudges, mm. to treat all people with respect, um, I thought was an amazing thing. How did that honor... Come on, let's put our hands together to celebrate that. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? Players come, players go. But the Admiral, 5-0, still has his thumbprint on this city. Isn't it interesting? The one thing that's synonymous with David Robinson, honor. If you've ever been to a Spurs game, he sits on the second row, opposite of the bench. How many of you have actually seen him sitting there? Would you just raise your hand? He's always at the home game. I saw him this past week. That seat next to him on the seat on the other side is always a different seat. He's engaging in conversation every time, giving honor to whoever has been seated next to him. We have no idea who God will put to sit next to you, not just in this room, but outside of here. But to operate in a winsome, irresistible influence is to understand 
though my circumstances, as he talked about his mom and dad, are challenging, honor all people. That's who we seek to be as a church. Not a title, a testimony. Not something we get, something that we give. And guess what we're giving? Grace. Talk about grace. We get to come to the Lord's table today to eat the bread, drink the cup. An invitation. Do you and I feel unworthy to come to the table today? Absolutely. But he invites us. He ushers us in. So I'm going to ask our communion team right now, if you begin to make your way to your stations, look at this army. Look at these men and women that faithfully serve. Grateful for y'all. It's not easy pouring juice in those little cups. For over 10,000, 11,000 people in our gatherings. But they do it because they love you and they want to honor you. So with heads bowed, eyes closed today, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, we invite you into an invitational relationship with Him. He's extending to you this invitation. And if you don't know Jesus, today is the day. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, if you want to receive Jesus, we're going to all pray this out loud. Let this be the declaration of your heart. Let's say this together, 10 o'clock service. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. We want to say thank you for listening today. We know that God's word once more never returns void. And today we would love to hear from you. We are a community of faith that exists to initiate and celebrate life change in Jesus' name. And your story, it's a story worth sharing. So could you email us at nextsteps at communitybible.com or you can visit us online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. Share your story so we could celebrate it. Know this, you're not alone in the journey. When you stand for Jesus, you never stand alone. And we at CBC Community Bible Church right here in San Antonio and in the region, we want you to know that we walk with you in these days, celebrating what God's doing in and through you, and know that your life matters. Until we meet again, much love.